So welcome back everyone to the channel. Today I have with you Coach David Powers. And Coach Powers is a clinical psychologist. He's a PhD who uses psychological techniques in CBT, DBT, mindfulness, and neuroplasticity building to help individuals fully recover from psych med dependence. So welcome. It's an honor to have you here, Coach Powers. How are you today? Thank you so much. I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Good. Yeah, it's an honor. And, um, you know, I love your program. I love what you're doing in the community. Um, it's obviously very needed um, in this community um, of people who are suffering. There's a lot of people out there and not a lot of providers are are doing this. Um, you know, therapists, psychologists, uh, practitioners, there, there are not many out there. So um, what brought you into this practice? Because it's not an easy you know, the, the career choice to make. Right. Right. Um, it certainly was never on my mind when I began my, you know, pursuing clinical psychology, that's for sure. I think you think you're going to do like marriage counseling or treat basic mental illness or go on to do research. Benzos was never part of that plan, you know? So it was kind of birthed in my, um, my own experiences with benzos, you know, benzo withdrawal, and a dependence and just a really wretched long battle trying to get off the drug and then sort of rehab everything, you know, which meant partly sort of going back into the past a little bit and looking at some of those things that maybe I didn't know were really factors, you know, the, call it the pre-existing condition, things of that nature. And then, you know, things that manifested during that tumultuous time, you know, so that was, there was a lot going on there for sure. But that that's how I ended up here, you know, the background in psychology and then this just became, you know, a, a mission in a sense. And it was funny because in at first I just kept not looking at it. You know, I kept thinking still at like the main mission was to go on and do research and, and all these other things. And then here it was this, you know, benzodiazepine, withdrawal dependence and all of this just staring me in the face. And finally I said, oh, I guess I'm a benzo coach. I think I, I think this is my calling, you know. Uh, yeah. I had a, a, a mentor that said, you know, whatever broke you, that's your mission. You know, yeah. whoever wounded you or broke you, that's, that's your real mission. And I thought, well, that makes a lot of sense, you know? Absolutely. And, um, when, when you say you were broken, so, um, you were actually on a benzo yourself and mm. ended up in the situation that you find a lot of your clients in, right. um, do you mind sharing a little bit of that story? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I actually started taking a uh, Valium for a muscle relaxer of all things, mm. but I, you know, when I first say that. It, it almost seems innocuous or something, but I actually had a lot of, you know, uh, I had a very tumultuous childhood. I was a victim of a hate crime, almost murdered when I was um, a teenage, a young teenager, you know, domestic violence in the household, like lots of things growing up, you know, that um, I think as a young person, you're not always um, readily uh, aware of. And you just sort of, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And you just sort of work and try to get through your life. But, but these things have a way of festering an, under the surface, you know. But ultimately, it was um, a car accident. And I had injured my neck and I got prescribed Valium after trying, you know, all kinds of pain meds and anti-inflammatories and muscle relaxers and all of these things. And, and nothing was working. And I, I mean, I got so desperate at one point, I was having Botox injected into my neck muscle. Because see, my 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 SEM here, muscle in the front, became really tight and contracted, and it was pulling the alignment of my neck. And I had a couple bulging discs. So they were, um, as a last ditch effort, they said try Botox. You know, nothing is releasing this muscle. Of course, I go there. I'm signing a death waiver every three months. You know, he's literally like, look, if I miss the muscle and hit that artery. That's it. You know, you're probably, you know, and so I was like, wow, that's scary. Yeah. You know, on top of dealing with a health issue, I'm like, I mean, it was a scary, every three months I dreaded it. You know, I wouldn't sleep the night before the whole time he's doing, I'm praying. I'm like saying my goodbyes. Cause you're like, oh. you know, and he, and at the time it was still very new. So he was like, look, I've never done this on anyone. So it was kind of like an experiment and it would get a little bit of relief and eventually it didn't last. And it um, ended up damage, damaging the muscle in my neck even further. So I was sinking in all of this health anxiety, thinking, oh my God, I'm so young. I'm so damaged. Um, you know, I'm hearing all these horror stories with an injury like that. I'm thinking by the time I'm 40, I'm going to be in a wheelchair or addicted to pain meds and I have no future. And I was really, I, I mean, I stopped sleeping and I was getting really anxious. And like I said, when you already have 
anxiety and certain traumas from your past, it's, it's, it's like a breeding ground for this stuff, you know, it's just accelerant. And, um, so finally as a last ditch effort, they tried like two milligrams of Valium and say, try this. I said, Valium. And they said, well, you know, originally it was kind of used as a, as a nerve medication and a, and a muscle relaxer. And I took it. It was amazing. I mean, um, for the first time in maybe a year and a half, I had relief, you know, and it wasn't like total relief, but it was enough. I could sleep. My anxiety went down. I had a lot of flexibility back in my neck. And the other thing that was happening was I was developing um, something called pain catastrophization, um, mm -hmm. kind of like a somatic disorder where my anxiety was so merging with the actual injury that the second I could be at work and I would have just a little tinge of like a pinch of, ener you know, of, of pain. And it would just immediately cause almost a panic attack. I would, my heart rate would go up and it was getting so tied into all those fears. It was like, I say like pain catastrophization is like having a panic attack in a specific part of your body, if you could imagine. Wow. And so I'd have to go, when that would happen, I would start to panic and I was working as a cook and I'd have to go and lay down because I was so worried that the pressure on my neck was pushing on those discs. You know, you start to mm -hmm. develop a little bit of that health anxiety. And mm -hmm. I was thinking, you know, oh my God, this is going to make it worse. And my boss would come out and find me laying in like a booth out front and go, what are you doing? I just need 10 minutes, you know, and um, and it was becoming a real problem for me. So the the pain catastrophization, that sort of somatic symptoms um, disappeared with the, with the Valium, as it mm -hmm. usually does with that kind of thing. And so I was like, wow, at the time still I have no idea what I'm looking at. I don't know what this means, any of this, you know, I'm, I'm so confused. I'm like in my early 20s and um you know, I, I'm on the benzo on the Valium for about three months and, you know, I'm doing physical therapy and it finally gets to a point where I'm like, you know, I don't want to be on anything, not, not long term, you know, I mean, I'm young and I think I'm going to come off of it. I talked to my doctor. He says, oh, you can just quit taking it. Why don't you do this? Just, well, how long you been on it? I said three months. He goes, just two milligrams, just quit. You'll be fine. So, okay. Listen to him, quit taking it about 48 hours later, I'm sitting on my front porch talking to my neighbor. It was a, a bit of a character. I think the guy probably created anxiety because he was a very high strung guy. And, and I remember actually, ironically, what happened was I laughed at one of his jokes. And when I laughed, I had this almost out of body experience for a second. I sort of shifted out of my body and was looking down and then I jumped back in and I went, Oh, what was that? Like, it was really weird. You know I mean? It was really a jolt to the system. Like it, and it felt neurological, neurological, almost like something had like a glass breaking in your brain or something, you know? And then immediately my skin became on fire and pins and needles and this overwhelming sense of doom arose through me and every cell in my body was screaming, you know? And I jumped up and I started running around the yard and I was holding my head as though it were going to fall off. I mean, you know, totally irrational, but, you know, you're in a state of panic. Um, and my, you know, my roommates came out, what's going on? And I said, I don't know, something horrible is about to happen. I just kept saying something horrible is about to happen. And they're like, what? Then they're freaking out. Like, is there a sniper in the bush? Or like, what is happening here? I go, I don't know. I can't explain it. And finally that wore off, you know, and I, and I was like, wow, what in the heck was that? You know? And I went to my, my prescribing doctor and I told him, he said, oh, it's your pre-existing condition reemerging. I said, oh, I, I thought, I think it's from coming off these meds. No, no, they wouldn't do that. You weren't on enough. We're not on it long. And that's your pre-existing. I said, I never had anything like that. I mean, I've had anxiety and I have, you know, issues. Don't get me wrong with things that I've dealt with anxiety and stress. And, and maybe I even have had some verge of panic attacks before that were mild, but this was catastrophic. Like this was your bell is rung. I mean, I could only think, you know, in my mind, it was, would have been like, you know, jumping out of a plane without a parachute or something on that level. I mean, it was just terrifying. Anyway, he talked me into staying back on the benzo, you know, you need it. It's giving you relief. It's not, you know, you come off any time. Hey, I stay on it. The years start to roll by, you know, two milligrams doesn't work. He bumps it up to four. He bumps it up to 10. And after about 10 years, you know, I'm at 40 to 50 milligrams now of Valium. And I'm still having trouble sleeping. I'm still having panic attacks inter intermittently, you know. Um, um, now I look back and realize I was in a lot of interdose withdrawal, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, you just keep chasing it. You keep trying more meds, more meds. And I'm like, finally, even at that point, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting educated. I'm getting close to beginning my master's program in clinical psychology. I'm starting to get a little bit more of a clue about these meds. And I'm like, I'm really starting to question the doctor. And he keeps telling me, no, they're fine. It's not that. It's your pre-existing condition. I'm thinking, God, how messed up am I? That 40, 50 milligrams of Valium's not touching it. 
And then anyway, well, one night I have a massive panic attack and my heart would not slow down. It was just beating for about an hour. And I started to get really scared that I was having like a cardiac event of some sort, you know, mm -hmm. I called the ambulance. I went to the hospital. They do EKGs, all these tests. I'm laying there praying, God, get me out of this. I'll change my life. I don't, I don't know what that means, but you know, because I was a pretty healthy guy. And um, the doctor comes back in after he looks at the blood work and he's very serious, you know, his arms are folded and he's really looking me up and down. And, and I remember a nurse, he's talking to a nurse and she said, should we give him a shot of, I think she said iron or something like that. And he said, no. And then he storms up to the, to the bed next to me and he says, you know, you're on enough Valium to tranquilize a small elephant. Do you realize that? And I said, no, I don't realize that. <laughs> Is that sounds bad. And he said, you know, he starts preaching to me about getting high. I say, sir, I don't get high. I don't get a buzz. I said, I don't even get normal. Like, it's so insulting what you're saying to me because I don't even get normal. I mean, I mean, this might as well be blood pressure meds or something that doesn't work for me. I just have to take it, you know? And so he's like shocked. And well, you got to get off it. This is, you're too young. This is too high of a dose. Is, you know, he said, heard. I go home, talk to my doctor. He says, um, well, he's disagreeing. I said, look, I'm coming off these meds. Help me do this. He goes, okay, cut the Valium in half. And in two weeks, cut that dose in half. And in another two weeks, cut that uh, remaining dose in half, you know. Okay, I have trepidation. He said, no, no, you know, I know best. Okay, I go home, I drop 20, 20 to 30 milligrams because I was kind of going between 40 and 50. It was starting to get up past the 40 milligram range. And I cut it in, do in half. I said, okay, 20 milligrams, that's my new starting point. And two, again, maybe 48 hours later, the gates of hell had opened. I mean, that was such a big drop. Um, I end up back in the ER two or three more times by ambulance, by ambulance, right? And I'm not someone that runs to the doctor for things, you know? And I'm like thinking I'm dying, you know? And he tries to give me, um, you know, the doctor finally, my prescribing doctor finally gives me Xanax. And he goes, well, you know, sometimes uh, benzos, they stop working. Let's try a new one. I said, well, Xanax. He goes, yeah, it's like switching wine for beer. So that was his analogy. Switching wine to beer, it's, it'll, it'll work. Oh my okay. god! I never heard of wine not working, but beer would. But okay, sure, yeah. we'll we'll go with that, <laughs> you know. And then he goes, uh, "Here's an antidepressant," you know. I think it was like Zoloft or something at the time. And um, I'm like, I don't want to be on any meds, you know. I'm, I want to come off these meds. And he's like, "Well, no, you have to." And and so I'm getting really depressed and I'm getting freaked out because you know, like I started on a muscle relaxer. How is this happening to me now mm -hmm. that I'm on? two met two new meds and then he started to talk about seroquel for sleep and i was like whoa, whoa whoa you know you're going too fast now we're talking about a third med so i go home he said you know when you wake up in the morning just switch over from the from valium to xanax you'll be fine i said i don't need a taper or nothing nope just switch right over and i wake up i take the xanax i have a paradoxical reaction immediately my heart rate goes way up i mean now this stuff is supposed to calm you down it completely throws me into a horrific panic attack I go back to the hospital by ambulance. Now it's starting to get ridiculous, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm starting to know these people, the ambulance people by name and face, you know? And at this point, I'm halfway to the hospital and I'm saying, you know, just pull over and let me out. And they're like, what? I said, I think this is a panic attack. I mean, I've been through this enough. I mean, it's unbelievable to me, but, and they said, no, we have to take you and we can't just let you out on the side of the road. I said, fair enough. And I sometimes joke because I, when I got the bills from those ambulance rides, I said it would have been cheaper to rent a, a stretched limo to the <laughs> hospital than it would have been those ambulances where they just put oxygen on you and take your blood pressure. Yeah. Uh, so after that day, I said, I'm never doing this again. I'm never doing this again. I mean, it has to be a real crisis, not just panic alarm, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, my doctor's not helping me. I just go back on Valium. At that point, I just sort of stopped talking to him about it because I'm like, He's gaslighting me. He's making me worse. He's not helping me. He's almost suggesting like he's going to rip me off the final 20 milligrams. So I'm wondering, we're not going to do that. So I just had to pretend I was compliant and not talk with, you know, not really talk to him about this. And I started getting really sick. You know, I'm like really quickly, my health, my mental health and physical health were going down the drain, you know, and I wasn't sleeping for days at a time. I was having three, four panic attacks a day. I mean, I was worried about um, just draining my adrenal glands at that point. I mean, it was just absurd, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, finally, you know, you get to a place where you start looking for answers. And I found the Ashton Manual, found a Benzo mm -hmm. community online. This has gone back over a decade. So it was a very different community than it is now. Now there's so much more help, so many more professionals, and everybody has a better sense of things. But even, you know, going back 10, 12 years, 
it was all, it was just scary. I mean, you you typed in Benzo Witcherall on YouTube, and it was just people crying and and filming themselves losing it on camera, and you're like going, oh my god. And then people talking about, you know, this took me years to taper and years to heal. And I'm, you know, so now it's sinking in, like, what did I get myself into? Two to four years to taper. And, you know, I mean, oh my God, you know, I'm going to be 40 years old by the time I get off these damn meds and, and heal. And, um, but I found the Ashton manual and that was the, really the first um, key piece of like change, you know, because mm -hmm. then I finally felt validated and I had a taper plan. Mm -hmm. And I tried it and it was a little too fast. So I, I kind of slowed it down. I think she wanted, she advised like one milligram of Valium tapered over between one or two weeks. I made it two or four weeks. It was more manageable. Mm -hmm. So I tried to taper and it's just going really sideways. I mean, it is so, so hard to taper even the smallest amount at that point, you know. And I'm reading all these groups and all these forums and Benzo Buddies and all of this stuff. And they're all saying the same thing. You've got a neurological brain injury, essentially. You're damaged. You can't afford to risk, you know, to do anything. You need to eat vegan. You need to reduce a very controlled diet. You need to lay and pray. I mean, I heard that, that exact slogan over and over. Lay and pray. Pray to God. Stay in bed. You know, don't get out of your bed. Don't do too much exercise. Therapy no. doesn't work. Exposure doesn't work. Supplements doesn't work. I mean, they had me terrified all the way down to like, what you know what mouthwash i use i was like is listerine okay you know i mean it really got to like crazy places i mean can wow. i eat salmon no i can't eat salmon okay you know i mean i was getting i was getting freaked out about sunlight you know i was getting mm -hmm. freaked out about everything and so this goes on for some months more and i'm just just going down and i'm getting so depressed i mean beyond depressed where you start to really think about checking out because you're just mm -hmm. like you know i never understood uh suicide until that experience right because and i and i remember thinking you know what really sent it home was after 9 11 and i read something that somebody wrote and i don't remember who wrote it but they said um those people that jumped out of the the towers on 9 11 holding hands they weren't jumping because they weren't afraid of death they weren't jumping because they weren't afraid of of heights or falling to their death they were terrified but the thought of burning being burnt alive was more terrifying and that hit me like to my heart, to my core. You know, I said, oh, my God, I get that. And that's when you start because, you know, your faith and your beliefs, you're like, I would never harm myself. But you're like, I'm burning alive here, yeah. you know, and it's not getting put out. And and how long can a human being hold on in this kind of state? You know, and it was really terrific. And um, so what happened was the turning point in all this was I my clinical psychology program, my master's program was coming around and I had signed up for it several months prior before all this happened. So it was like on a break, you know, and it came around and the first parts of it were online. So that was, a, that was, that worked for me because it was online. I didn't have to go anywhere and do anything. It was kind of an introduction. And, um, but still at the time I'm like, I can't read, I can't comprehend. I can't, you know, like this is still, so then it's another um, uh, blow to your ego and to your life because you're like, I think I'm going to have to quit my academic pursuit right in the middle of it after all these already put five years into working really hard here and I'm about to have to drop out of school and now future uncertain loans probably how am I going to pay back my loans you know I end up having to move back home with my mother and you know live in her spare room and so you start to feel bad about yourself like who wants mm -hmm. to do that at 30 or something you know mm -hmm. or any age really you know you move away you're making a life for yourself and then now you're you're just starting back from you feel like a teenager again living under your mom's rules you know mm -hmm. um so that was very wild and um but what i realized what made me stick with the program and just give it a shot because the first semester was on anxiety treatments and uh, disorders and i was like you know what i'm really good at ruminating i am really really good at um looking up things for 24 hours, a, basically a day online. I mean, I could, if I did, I barely slept and I would just be glued to my monitor. Re I would have multiple tabs open. I'm reading about receptor damage and different types of this and that. And, you know, and I would just be, I was consuming it like a sponge, you know? Yeah. I had to read it a lot and it took a while to comprehend more than I could have normally. Right. Mm -hmm. But I was fixated on it and I was retaining a lot of it. So I thought, well, maybe, maybe this psychology course, maybe there's an answer. Maybe there's some kind of clue because I'm not getting it from my doctor. Mm -hmm. um, I can't afford, you know, I didn't have the money to afford like a really good psychologist. And now looking back, I don't know if he would have been able to help at the time either for what I was going through. Maybe the, maybe the program will have some kind of clue, you know. So I 
I go forward. It's online. You know, I don't have to be on camera or anything. I'm just a lot of reading, which was really hard. And I downloaded these various programs that read to you, which mm -hmm. made it easier, you know, because my eyes were so blurred and hard to focus on monitors. So I'd lay in bed and I would just play over the chapters over and over and over, just combing through them, for looking for clues. And I think this really helped me in my um, professional development because, you know, it's easy to take your academic studies loosely and you just start to fixate on wanting to pass. I think it's a different thing when you are looking for a cure for yourself. You start to internalize this knowledge because it's like food. It's like, I need this to survive. There's got to be something in this for me, you know? And um, sure enough, that first course, the very first thing I learned uh, in anxiety management was sort of the, the, the genesis of anxiety disorders, how it begins with like apprehension and, and, and how it can, you know, cascade and, and manifest into other things. And, and as I'm reading all this, you know, there are these check marks about the factors or traits of mental illness and things that breed mental illness, things like isolation, uh, avoidance, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, rumination, all of this stuff. And I'm going, I'm checking the box. Yep, I ruminate. <laughs> yep, I'm isolated. Yep, I'm avoiding everything. Yep, 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 yep. I'm just, you know, and, and finally it's undeniable where I'm like, I'm doing this to myself to some degree. Now, the benzo certainly did a heck of a lot. There's no one denying that. Yeah. But my coping or lack of coping skills was what really was doing me in in the end. I, I was scared of everything. I was stand up and I had developed pot syndrome and I, I, would just lay back down because I was too scared to even move wow. and I was too scared to eat and I was too scared to, to get sunlight. I mean, all of these things. And I realized like, I am my own worst enemy right now and something has to change here if I'm going to survive this. So I um, started to put together kind of a, what I called at the time a recovery program, you know, a checklist of things that I could do every day and start to push back. And the mm -hmm. first thing, one of the first things I did was learning how to kind of lull my, lull my limbic system down and I started to learn that that bed was associated with suffering and I needed to get out of that bed. It was like a black hole, you know, I was a quicksand, I was sinking in it. So I started to get out of the bed more. Maybe I'd hang out in the living room and I would, I started, uh, I had a hot tub at the time and I would get in the hot tub and I started, you know, lighting candles and putting nice fragrance in there. And I was doing all this self lulling stuff and mm -hmm. deep breathing. And then, then I started to graduate into exposure therapy and, then I started to, to graduate into adding a little bit of exercise, which really consisted of like a hundred steps extra a day or something to my mm -hmm. step counter, you know. But eventually, after about a month or two of doing this, I started to notice a couple little trickles of sunlight coming back, you know, and my energy levels increased a little bit, just a little, and my sleep improved just a little, and my sensitization issues diminished just a little. And I could find, you know, and at one point I was so agoraphobic, I couldn't even walk to my mailbox. I mean, I walked mm -hmm. outside to check the mail, had a massive panic attack. The earth was spitting and chaotic and I ran right back to the house, mm -hmm. you know, and that, and actually that was the real turning point for me. I mean, once you get to that level, you, there's no denying, like I am in deep trouble. I mean, mm -hmm. I am, if I can't check the mailbox, you know, I mean, where does this go? It's mental institution or something next, right? Is what you're thinking at the time. And, um, so I started learning how to do graded exposure, you know, and mm -hmm. literally opening my front door, my back door, I would get dizzy. So I would open the door and I would put the chair right there near the door open and I would see it and I would breathe and I would do all my grounding techniques and I would let it because now I'm learning about how this stuff works with the limbic system and how it reacts to fear and mm -hmm. reinforces it and all of this. So and then, you know, the door after a week, it wasn't bothering me keeping it open. So then every morning I would take my chair and I'd put it just outside the door. Now that was scary again, but not too scary. I mean, it was bearable. And yeah. then after about a week, that wasn't scary. And then I put the chair, you know, 20 feet out from the door closer to the mailbox and slowly but surely I finally got to the mailbox again. And I remember that when I got to the mailbox and I could touch it and check the mail and, and not panic, it was like winning the Olympics, you know, it was like, Oh yes. <laughs> it's funny how your life changes, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, that suddenly was a victory. It was like, wow, I could do that. Okay. That's giving me hope. Now I'm tapering using, you know, like a modification of the Ashton manual, which I didn't kept modifying into like a micro taper. I didn't even hear about micro tapers at the time. So I was still trying to move, you know, diminish the drug about one milligram of volume every four weeks, roughly. Mm -hmm. But I would do it more so by, you know, gradually reducing that, you know, that amount um, over a period of 30 days. So it was mm -hmm. before I would just drop a milligram and you would get hit 
and then you were in bed for a week and then you fought your way out of it. And so I was doing it, I was finding, you know, less is, is more gradually through the process. It made it more manageable. And then I could keep consistent on all the exercises and things I was doing. Mm -hmm. So you fast forward a year, year and a half, two years. I have really, now I have, I've churned through 75% of my um, clinical psych program, which was, um, it was a clinical, a master's in clinical psychology with a specialization in counseling. It was APA and it was all, you know, aimed at, um, getting out and just getting your internship and being, you know, a master clinician at that level. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot more uh, stuff in there than say your generic masters in psychology, right? Because mm -hmm. it was clinical studied or emphasized. And so by this point I had learned so much, I mean, so much stuff about uh, depression, anxiety, trauma, neurology, psychopharmacology. I mean, I was really absorbing it and I had put together a pretty solid program for myself. I was building mm -hmm. neuroplasticity I was doing exposure therapy. I was doing exercise. I was doing a tons of lolling stuff that was helping my limbic system come down, my diet, my nutrition. I mean, I was really checking everything, sunlight, you name it. Everything mm -hmm. was going just like it should. And in the end, I, I was getting better. As I was getting lower in, my, in the dose, I was getting better and better. And finally, I dropped off at two milligrams of Valium. And you know, at that point, I remember the night I dropped two milligrams, it was just after my birthday, and I was feeling so good that I scheduled a um, a uh, art show because I had worked, you know, for many years as a fine artist and I had pretty good success. And that was another element of the story was when I uh, went through this, my art career was annihilated. It just annihilated it. So here I had worked for, you know, my whole life up to that point to, to have a career. I was showing artwork in Los Angeles and New York and Italy and Canada. And like it was finally starting to take root, you know, where things were happening. And then benzos came and, and it just was gone. There was no creating. There was nothing for two years. So at the end of that two year, you know, climb out of uh, hell, basically, I was getting so motivated. I was like, I want to do an art show. And I started painting and I painted this little series and I went and um, I scheduled a uh, or booked a, a, um, a showing at a, at a big coffee shop. It was a nice coffee shop in town, but it was a big one, a big coffee shop. Mm -hmm. And um, so I took my last dose and I drove myself to that gallery or that coffee shop slash gallery it was kind of a mix the guy was doing a lot of gallery work and so he had it really nice you know like a mm -hmm. gallery it was like a gallery that served coffee which to me is the best of both worlds so mm -hmm. um couldn't drink coffee at that time but still loved the smell went in there i'm thinking nobody's gonna show up it was like 50 people there were standing room in the back i remember vividly we had to get a chair for a pregnant lady to sit down there was people outside. I was like, oh my God, I was so excited to be off the Benzo and mm -hmm. to celebrate it in this way of like coming back to my life, you know? Yeah. And um, at the same time going, wow, I am in deep. I am overwhelmed at this. I mean, I'm still shaking off the cobwebs and dealing with really profound anxiety and uh, still dealing with a lot of agoraphobic, agoraphobia uh, symptoms, you know? Mm -hmm. And, but I got in there and I did, you know, I, I played music. I played three songs in front of this group of people that are like arms reach away from me, which was terrifying. Um, I showed the art on the walls. I spoke about the art. The paper was there. I mean, it was a big deal. Like for a small town, it was a very cool deal. And I was so proud of that and so terrified. It was such a, a mixture of like terror and joy. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. if you can imagine those two things sort of existing simultaneously. And um so yeah, I, that was my celebration off Benzos. I worked for the next year or two. Um, I had got into my doctoral program and I just kept working. I just kept working on myself. And about a, after about a year or so, I, I realized what was left really I couldn't 100% say was Benzos. I mean, mm -hmm. now it felt like some of my old self and it felt like a handful of other things that had manifested like insomnia, agoraphobia and such. So I said, you know what? From here out, I'm just going to work on myself. I'm not going to play this game of convincing myself I have permanent brain damage and all of this. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm just going to treat the symptoms is here out and treating the symptoms until yeah. something shows me otherwise. That's what I'm going to do because that's healthy. I think that's mm -hmm. truly healthy to do that. And um, I got better and I just kept getting better. And after a few years, I was like, I'm better now than I was on the Benzo and I'm better now than I was before the Benzo. So not only did I make a recovery, I think I made 110 or 150% recovery, you know? Yeah. And Ever since then, it just set me on this course to continue self-exploration, self-development and, and that. And, mm -hmm. you know, earned my PhD in clinical psych, um, came back um, to the community and wanted to see what was going on, you know, because it had been mm -hmm. some years. And I, I say it's like getting out of Alcatraz for a crime you never committed. Like you don't really, 
want to go back for for a visit anytime soon <laughs> you know so I said, hey you want to you want to be a tourist no i don't thank you i want to pretend like that place doesn't exist thanks but eventually my curiosity got to me and i felt like i was in a good place so i came back to the community and i was like oh my god it's still here not only is it still here it's gotten exponentially worse there's so many more people so much more fear the organizations are bigger the rules are bigger all of this stuff had had just sort of developed profoundly and it was good and bad there was more good resources and there was more bad advice and terror you know that mm -hmm. i found in the community and so in fact there was a lot more terror and so mm -hmm. what i wanted to do was i put out a video anonymously because now i'm starting to get back to working as an artist i'm looking at my future as a future clinician and i'm thinking well, i don't want to put my face out there because that might be weird you know so I just put out an anonymous video and I titled it Life After Benzos. And I titled it, um, what was it, it was a series I went, eventually did called Life After Benzos. But I just titled it, um, uh, Do You Do you Heal After Benzos or something to that effect. It's still available on my YouTube channel. But um, so I put that out and everybody went crazy because all I wanted to tell them was the good news, like the gospels, you know, yeah. hey, there's hope. There's light on the other side. You will get better no matter how crazy this feels or how damaged you feel. I know you think you have brain damage. I know you think you have all, you know, it will improve. But mm -hmm. also my emphasis always was, but we got to meet it halfway. You know, we got to meet it halfway. You cannot keep laying in bed and praying and all of that and, yeah. and just isolating and avoiding and, and ruminating and think that something is going to change. I think that's, it's a bad investment, you know? Yeah. And um, I put out that video. It got a huge pop. I mean, really big pop. And, and people were literally saying, put out more content. They were like demanding it. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, I put another video and the same response, another, another. And then it just kept growing until people were like, you're really positive. You're a really fresh voice in this community because you're the only one giving us hope at the time, you know? Mm -hmm. And there was so much doom and gloom. And, and I was like, you know, then people said, I think you're giving false hope. I think you're, you know, and I said, no, no, I would never do that. That's not my, mm -hmm. that's like an insult to my own integrity. Like I would never give you false hope. I'm giving you real hope. Yeah. like real hope. And I'm giving you the caveat of how to get there, which is work. I'm not just yeah. saying, you know, you're going to wake up one day and it's all gone necessarily, but it's true. Most, if not everyone, if you ride it out long enough, you will get better. I mean, receptor wise and all that, mm -hmm. you will heal. But what is left in the wake of benzos, I think it's mis gets lost. And I could have easily sat there still battling insomnia, panic, depression, agoraphobia, mm -hmm. you know, health anxiety, and then I could have still called that benzo damage. And I, and then if I did that, in my mind, it was like, then there's no way to fix that, right? Mm -hmm. It disarms you to actually engage that. So anyway, um, you know, put out videos, then I put out a book, and the whole way I was like this reluctant uh, warrior or hero in this community in a sense. Like, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't want to acknowledge that this could be my home. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought, well, I'll put out a couple of videos and then I'll leave. All right, I'll put out a book and then I'll leave. All right, I'll do some coaching and then I'll, leave, you know, <laughs> and then before I know it, it was like, this is what I am now. I'm, yeah. This is at least for this chapter in my life. I'm a benzo coach. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I dedicated all my time, you know, to this. And uh, last year, even released a school, you know, opened mm -hmm. up a school online, which has been just the best thing I've ever done and have now worked here for several years in the community, almost a decade now worked with probably well over a thousand people from around the planet. I mean, around the planet. I've talked wow. to so many people from New Zealand, you know, Zimbabwe, like, mm -hmm. you know, it's just been incredible. And I've learned so much about people. And you also learn that we're all the same, you know, mm -hmm. the same problems, the same fears, the same worries, the same situations. It doesn't matter what color you are, what gender you are, how old you are, or where you live. It's the human condition, you know, it's the human That's experience. That's right. Yeah. So, and th that's amazing. Um, you know, your story and, and where you've come from, it expresses a lot of growth, a lot of hope, but also like you mentioned, um, you've taken this experience that you had and you've turned it into something positive to bring the message to other people. Cause it was lacking. Right. And, um, in, in my opinion, you know, I see this too, um, uh, when, when, I had talked to you about this before and then on, on we, you know, I was just on his um, channel as well. So if you guys want to see that interview, go to his YouTube. Yeah. Um, but we had a conversation about that um, with the, with the communities. And it seems like years later, this was what, 10, 10 years ago or more for you. Yeah. 
But here we are now and we're still experiencing a lot of fear with um, this tapering process. There's a lot of myths out there, I believe. Um, I do believe that a lot of it is rooted in some form of truth, you know, where people people are anxious, right? People are, um, your nervous system is, is dysregulated, right? You're getting some weird stuff like ringing in the ears. Like, you know, we can't deny some of these symptoms, the, the depersonalization, the derealization that you initially experienced, et cetera, is, um, is real. It's scary real too, because you're like, this never happened to me before. I've never had this kind of numbness and tingling and zaps and all these feelings, um, and of course the anxiety is, is trumping them all. Right. right. And so when we live life and we do certain things and maybe some, you know, symptom emerges, we blame the thing we just did. Yeah. Like it must've yeah. been cause I went outside. I, right. I had this experience, you know, and then, right. and I think that's where, um, I think well-meaning people start sharing their knowledge, you know, well, for me, it was when I ate this or I did that, or I tried this supplement or I tried yeah. this, you know, therapy. Um, and so I think a, a good way to look at this is individual, you know, what yeah. works with you, which is what it sounds like you're now doing. Yeah. And um, you mentioned your book and um, I have a copy here, um, the powers manual. So for those of you who don't have it yet, it's a good book to get it's a good read it actually encompasses a lot of what what he just mentioned um his story um developing a checklist and kind of breaking it down so he takes his whole experience and process and puts it in a book and a guide for you to follow and Mm -hmm. i think it's it's wonderful and it's amazing and from that i think you've helped people alone one of my patients actually um who uh, i was helping you know maybe a year ago now, um, she actually um, told me about you and said, you're in Florida. Oh, well, Dave Powers is in Florida too. And and yeah. the, you got to get his book. And it really helped me, you know, with a lot of this, that stuff, like, you know, that she was dealing mm. with. Um, when, when I started helping her, she was dealing with more um, health related kind of issues, gut anxiety kind of issues, but right. she had um, really done a lot of work here uh, with just your book and introduced me to it. And so I got it and read it and thought it was wonderful. Right. And then I heard about um, your program that you have now. Yeah. And so I would love for you to share, you know, um, that aspect of things, because you actually um, have a unique voice in the Benzo community. Um, this isn't a fear-driven model. It's not a purist model by any means, right. um, which means like you just don't do anything. You just kind of wait it out. And like you said, the lay right. and pray and those kinds of things. Um, right. And you actually have a program that you know walks people through it. So I'd love right. for you to, to talk about the program um, and then what you do um, aside from the program to help, uh, you know, these clients that are suffering. Well, thank you. And, Mm -hmm. and uh, the core of it, if I had to break it down in simplistic terms is, you know, I have these basic uh, tenets or beliefs about this. And one is, you know, what we're going through is a temporary brain injury, you know, not like a traumatic brain injury, not something you cannot come back from, but yeah, there are definitely physiological changes that are happening that one cannot deny. Receptors mm-hmm. and all. I mean, there's something profound happening here. Obviously, we were talking about. Um, so that's number one that there that there's a temporary injury. Uh, two, this temporary injury requires a kind of neurological rehabilitation, mm-hmm. right? Like we need to work and engage it, and there is something we can do to facilitate our recovery and speed up. And even if it's just neuroplasticity, it works and it's powerful. But of course, in my stories, I share, and that's why I kind of went long winded with my story a little bit, because there was clues as to how I got better. And so things like the effects of exercise, even on a small, gradual building level is profound. 30 minutes of walking, they say a day for, I think, uh, three months can be as effective as Zoloft for people. That's pretty incredible. Where's that commercial? Mm -hmm. Why are we not seeing that on television, you know, or the exposure therapy and rumination Mm -hmm. control and all of this stuff, you know, um, so there are things that we can do to, to push back a little bit, you know, and with varying success at various, sta- various stages of, of recovery. So it's an injury. We need to re- build a, re- a neurological rehabilitation. 
And and finally, the idea was that the injury is much more kind of, I say the word maniacal, maybe that's a little extreme, but to me, I look at it as almost maniacal uh, or, or, or more encompassing, I guess would be more scientific way of putting it, mm -hmm. um, than what we give it credit for. Meaning it's not just the, that it does receptor damage and, and create this host of physiological problems, but that it merges with the pre-existing condition, whatever it was. It almost reminds me of like COVID, you know, where they said like whatever you had before, it could kind of exacerbate. Mm -hmm. You know, if you had a little bit of sleep issues or something, you could develop, mm -hmm. you know. So that's how I started looking at um, uh, benzos. I was like, God, whatever it was, if you had a little health anxiety, get ready. It's going to yeah. likely really exacerbate that issue. Mm -hmm. Sleep or depression. I mean, it finds your demons and it feeds on them in a weird way, you know. The idea was that you had to go back and obviously address some of those issues at some point and something now i'm not saying in the middle of benzo withdrawal is a great time to go back and work on childhood trauma or something like that mm -hmm. but various levels you know depending you find an entry point and try to do something gradual at least mm -hmm. at the very least you try to stop it from uh developing into a tidal wave over you you know yeah. and then i realized that you had the pre-existing condition i eventually called these the three mountains of benzos you know you had the pre-existing you had the taper and then i said you had the manifested conditions you had things that manifested. So what's the price of sitting in bed for me, for my example, for several months, not sleeping, multiple panic attacks, agoraphobic, all of that stuff. What's the price of that, right? And you mm -hmm. can't just look at that as just merely symptomatic of benzos. It's like, and even if you can, okay, fine. But they become their own conditions, you know? Mm -hmm. So even after your receptors heal and things start to get better, say you developed insomnia, well, that's a circular problem. That can persist. You got to work on insomnia. It doesn't yeah. always, sometimes it does, but not always does those things just clear up quickly after benzo. So mm -hmm. my idea was, again, that you needed neurological uh, rehabilitation, but that benzos created circular problems. They, they created problems that by our, usually our own maladaptive uh, coping mechanisms, we made them worse, laying mm -hmm. and praying, avoidance, mm -hmm. isolation, all of this, all this stuff, all this fear and, and rumination running amok. Like mm -hmm. this is a breeding ground for worse things. You know, yeah. and so what I created was uh, would have eventually became at least 14 dimensions of recovery. And it was 14 areas. Now, this is over a decade of work. Right. Like this didn't yeah. happen overnight. This is a lots of education, a ton of experience and mm -hmm. a lot more experience. Right. Yeah. And I realized that there was at least 14 dimensions, as I called them, of recovery and things like diet and nutrition, sunlight. Um, exposure, exercise, mindfulness, all this stuff. And I said, you really need, if you're really going to hit this thing with everything you got, you really should consider uh, working on every dimension of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Really treat the whole person, the whole individual, the whole life, you know, that which is part of my philosophy anyway. Mm -hmm. So um, that was the core of it, you know, neurological damage, um, needs neurological rehabilitation, and that there were at least these dimensions to be get to get working on. And from there, I started creating a kind of neuro uh, a neuroplasticity program and a neural rewiring program. You know, working on those type of things. And in, indeed, it was a checklist. You know, just like I used all these years later. I still they're a little more fancy looking, maybe, but they're you know they're um, the same kind of thing that I was using. And I found that held you accountable to have checklists. You know, do you wake up and there was a strategy when you woke up? You know, I have my my students do um, uh, at least three exercises before they get out of bed in the first five minutes. That's right? great. And not one of these things in itself is going to be like a miracle cure. As I tell people, there are no fire extinguishers in benzo withdrawal, mm -hmm. but it's a cumulative accumulation and time and practice. They can really start to become real powerful tools for you. You know, mm -hmm. and you can start to forge your way into new, healthier mindsets and, and attitudes and create new uh, neural pathways. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was these checklists of things that you could before you get out of bed, you have, say, these three exercises and you can knock them off your checklist in the morning. All right. I did that. I did that. I did that. OK, now we're going to do this thing and this thing. And so it kept you through your day working toward things, mm -hmm. achieving goals, um, establishing baselines and then gently growing and expanding from those baselines and setting new goals that were, you know, constantly evolving. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, and that, and that, and that was, I mean, I'm, I'm putting it in a, in a nutshell, of course, but, um, mm -hmm. and, and the other thing I did, which I thought was great is, you know, you work in this community long enough and you work with enough people, you see a lot of, uh, trends. So I saw mm -hmm. phases of recovery. I saw stages of recovery and I saw steps of recovery. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so one of the first things I did when I was started even 
first conceived of opening up a benzo school was I wanted to create a, a system of stages. Mm -hmm. So I created four stages of recovery and I called them uh, stage one's restoring hope, the uh, new foundation, the montage and coming home. Right. Mm -hmm. And so each stage I had three key learning goals mm -hmm. and then three key uh, roadblocks you know, based on what I saw. And it got to the point where when I had a new client or even an old client that reached out maybe in crisis, maybe I haven't spoken to them in some months. And just within maybe minutes of talking to them, I already could almost see these stages and go, they sound like they're stuck in stage one or stage two. And it sound like they're stuck in the, the key learning uh, roadblock uh, number three, you know, maybe mm -hmm. it was something like uh, one of them was uh, doing too much too soon, mm -hmm. doing too much too soon. They came off the benzo. Mm -hmm. They kind of were re ready to get back to life and they pushed it too hard too soon, had a flare up, said, oh, my God, reactivated trauma and then started to snowball. Right. Mm -hmm. So by giving them these stages, it was like you were creating a bridge to say, here's what you should be doing at this point. And then there's a bridge to this next place. And if you actually do these things, if you meet these key learning goals and you, you know, you avoid the roadblocks, it, you could progress to the next stage. But then the next stage had three new learning goals and three new roadblocks, right? Mm -hmm. And it just wrote itself. I mean, you do this long enough, you see this stuff. And so, like I said, I had created, you know, for the last decade working, you know, last, especially the last several years, just working like a madman, you know, on this stuff. I mean, it really consumed me. And um, I like maps. You know, I like mm -hmm. looking at things like, you know, in a way that is very easy to understand and it can show me the sort of the bigger reality of something like that. Yeah. So um, creating the stages, uh, the steps, and then more recently, I created 15 phases that I wrote into a book that we can maybe get into later. But yeah. um, but very helpful stuff, you know, roadmaps is what I was looking at. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, I was creating things that I was like, God, this is what I wish I had when I was going through this. I wish I had this, you know, but you... You don't know what you don't know, and um, it, it took a life experience to kind of to to create that, and yeah. um, it's been wildly successful. Now I've opened a school, and um, I and and also you know why I opened the school was because I would you know you do um, coaching and, and and you do very similar work to me, mm -hmm. and sometimes it feels very limiting. Mm -hmm. You know you do your intake, you hear the client story, and then you got maybe thirty minutes or fifteen minutes maybe to sort of unpackage all that, try to make some sense, try to give them some advice, and then and then it's sessions over, mm -hmm. and then you always have this sense when you hang up of like, did I give them enough? Did yeah. I really reach them? What if they don't come back to me? What if I confuse them more? Oh my god, you know, and you don't want to beg them. It's like, please come back so I can try to finish chapter two of this, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I just always felt limited, you know, and and then I realized I was teaching a course almost essentially through my coaching, you know, I was mm -hmm. constantly teaching in some ways I almost feel more like a professor than I do a coach, mm -hmm. you know, because I believe people are, we're all very similar. And if you give people the right tools, they and show them some things they can, they can do the rest, you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't me being above them or I know more. It was, it was nothing like that. It was like, here's how you, you know, here's how you can do this. And, um, mm -hmm. it, it just became, um, uh, very success, uh, very successful. In my practice to create a program, a video course with you know animations and all of this, and I could sit down over the period of about three years and really map that out in in just what I want to say, in just the way I want to say it, in just the order I want to say it, mm -hmm. you know, and create this streamline of like here you go, and then you know it made sense to open up the school to create a community to host the recovery program in the school, mm -hmm. and then. Um, so now if I have a, a new client and I do the same thing, you know, I'm trying to mm -hmm. reach them and all of that at the end, if I don't know if I'm going to hear from them again, I say, you know what, you might consider go through these modules. Mm -hmm. And even I even offer them a guarantee. I say, if they, if you got nothing uh, out of it, I'll refund your money. It's, it's mm -hmm. 30 bucks a month. It's not about the money. Mm -hmm. I honestly want to help people, you know, and, yeah. and if you do get something out of it, I know as a coach, we're going to do more meaningful work anyway. Yeah. You know, so go try this, you know, and it's been very helpful. Some of them do, some of them don't. The ones that do, I mean, it almost, it, it expedited the whole process because, you know, all the questions they kept writing me with, what about this? And what I go, just try the, the modules, you know, you can go mm -hmm. through it in a, a couple of nights and it will answer 85% of your questions, you know, and then you'll mm -hmm. come back to me with new questions and there'll be more meaningful questions. There'll be more, you know, relevant questions actually, instead of the same old, can I take magnesium? Can I do, yeah. you know, and it's like, oh my God, there's a thousand of forums on that. It feels like, you know, Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's it in a, in a, in a nutshell, you know, that was the, 
the kind of the genesis of it, the the core staples of it, and then how it evolved into more of a more encompassing program that I'm still building on, you know, yeah. I'm still building on and making it really like with the school, I'm really trying to make it a course, you know, yeah. uh, a community and, think, and a course. I know? think that's what certainly I, I, that's what sets you apart. Um, you know, there are coaches out there um, that are doing similar work as you, but it sounds like you were able to take, you know, what you, what you know, and what you've done, like personal experience, but now 10 years of helping yeah. other people, thousands of people and yeah. being a PhD, you know, it's in your nature to want to figure out what are the similarities here? What are the, and put yeah. it into, you know, kind of, you know, package it up and say, you know what, yeah. I can make a program with this. I mean, that is right. amazing. So you're giving back um, more so than, than what you can in, in sessions. Cause I think yeah. you can reach more people with the program with the school that's more accessible at $30 a month than you can with individual coaching, you know, um, and, and doing that because sometimes it it is a cost factor that kind of holds someone back from, from doing one-on-one coaching. But if they can at least do the school, they'd get a lot of um, great information from that. So, um, so that's available on your website. You know, people can go there, uh, powers coaching, uh, powers benzo coaching powers benzo coaching.com yep. i'll make sure to put all his links in the description um i also want to talk about you mentioned um this new book you're almost done mm-hmm. writing this book and i'm excited i i hope um you know i, I get to know first <laughs> or at least close to you know when when this book will be released and and sure. i'll certainly um get that book and we can have you back on but yeah. can we talk a little bit about the book and, yeah, and uh, you mentioned like 15 phases, like, can you touch on yeah. some of that? And it sounds yeah. very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so yeah, it's 15 phases. And mm-hmm. um, again, you do a lot of this work. So I know you'll probably relate to this. You mm-hmm. see themes and things, mm-hmm. you know, dare I say, you see phases that people go through. If you look at all your clients that are just entering the benzo you know, from the very first day they go, Oh my God, I have a problem. There's a, there's a problem that needs to be addressed here. Mm -hmm. And they're getting ready to taper to the person who's already tapered off a benzo and they're now kind of finding their way back to their life. Like Mm -hmm. if you look at those, again, you can break them down into stages or steps, but I noticed these like sort of phases and not everybody um, fell into every phase, of course, Mm -hmm. but, but a, a, a significant portion of people did. For sure. Mm-hmm. Enough stages. Some of them, all the stages, you know, mm-hmm. and um, I, I kind of made it like a little bit like a linear. Uh, the book was sort of designed linear in a sense of like, here's maybe the first stage you would go through and then the next and the next and the next in a logical order. And then I would break it down. And so, like, for example, the first mm-hmm. stage is uh, the obsessive answer seeking phase. Mm-hmm. Right. That's the first phase. I should say the first chapter, the obsessive answer seeking phase. Right. And we all, everybody's been through this and it, it knows about this phase. It's, it's the, Oh crap moment. And of course your reflex are going to go rush to the internet and try to find information. Mm-hmm. You know, you're scouring the earth for everything, every specialist, every podcast, every, you know, and you're just absorbing all this and trying to learn. And that was followed by what I called the miracle cure phase. Mm-hmm. I mean, and um, at that phase, <laughs> you kind of start getting desperate and you start looking for a Hail Mary you can throw. Oh, wouldn't it be nice if it all was just magnesium? Or wouldn't it be nice (laughs) if I could just switch the benzo over to this other benzo? Or wouldn't Mm -hmm. it be nice? You know, you, 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 you know, maybe it's an NAD infusion, maybe it's Mm. microdosing or ketamine or whatever. You start to just look for these like sort of miracle cures, you know, and they're kind of hit or miss. Sometimes people have really great experiences with them. I, I think it's rare that I see someone whose whole benzoyl journey was just completely turned around by, you know, vitamin D or something per se, mm-hmm. but, mm-hmm. but some of it can be very, very helpful. And some, for some people, it might really turn them around, but still the emphasis was on the lost search, which to yeah. me was still speaking rumination. You know, the mm-hmm. obsessive answer seeking phase was the birth of rumination, which, um, you know, we know breeds mental illness and it exacerbates yeah. benzo withdrawal symptoms profoundly. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we move from the obsessive answer seeking phase to the miracle cure phase and, and so on and so forth through 15 mm-hmm. phases of these things. I won't read them all for you. Maybe we'll yeah. do that next time I come on, but, um, yeah. but yeah, they were really interesting phases. And I, and also what it allowed me to do not is not to just identify these phases mm-hmm. and write them would have been interesting enough, but it allowed me to kind of stretch out 
as a, again, sort of a benzo professor or coach mm -hmm. and teach a very updated version of a lot of, you know, I wrote that first book you, you just plugged, you know, 2018, I think, you know, mm -hmm. like, oh my God, it's like six years old now already. I can't believe it. Mm -hmm. And it feels a little dated to me, you know, as far as my mm -hmm. teachings and my program and, and, and things are a lot still more. Still very relevant though. So very relevant. Oh yeah, absolutely. It. It's still very no, no, relevant. No. Lots of very good relevant. stuff here. Yeah. And it's a great, it's a great entry point into me mm -hmm. and what I do. So I think it's very like kind of maybe necessary reading in a sense, mm -hmm. but I wanted to build off that because I, you know, you know, I, I was having more insight, more metaphors, more teachings, more, and you get better as longer you do something like this, you, yeah. you get better at presenting the information and outlining it. And I said, I want to come back and, and, and fill in the gaps that I left short on that book. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, and so, not only am I doing the 15 phases, but I, you know, every time I had a relevant chance to, you know, expand on something that was a core teaching, I took, I took, you know, I took the chance. And so mm -hmm. I feel like the book, I'm really proud of it. Actually, I think it's the, one of the best things I've ever done really. And for, I mean, especially for Benzo um, recovery, because it create, I created the roadmap and I was also able to sprinkle a lot of my coaching principles and teachings in there mm -hmm. and, and, and actually expand on it more, you know? So I'm yeah. very, yeah, I'm very, very proud of it. And I can't wait to to share that. That's amazing. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it as well. And um, if people want to learn more about what you do or say they're struggling with benzo withdrawal, they're in the one of these phases, um, yeah. you know, what's the best way to reach you? Is it through your website? Yeah, I have a, mm -hmm. um, my website is powersbenzocoaching.com. The mm -hmm. school is uh, benzorecoveryschool.com. Mm. Um, and you can go on the website, learn more about me. I have resources and, you know, I plug, uh, we made a, um, a Benzo recovery feature film. That's there's information about mm. that on there mm. blogs. I put out a new blog on recovery every week. And, um, and then there's an online calendar so you can, you know, you can reach out to me or schedule a session. Wonderful. The, yeah. The, but, yeah. And then more information on YouTube and do you have Instagram too? I do have Instagram. I think it's um, Powers Benzo Coaching, if I'm not mistaken. I need to okay. do a little more on that. I've yeah, we'll get you all your that. links and we'll put them in the description then um, down below. So make sure to check the description for links to go ahead and, and contact yeah. uh, Coach Powers and learn more about his coaching program and perhaps even um, his school. You know, if this is something you're interested in and you're in, you're in the throes of benzo withdrawal and you're feeling stuck, um, this is definitely a good avenue. You're going to get a lot of positivity yeah. here. Um, and you're not going to get shunned or f feel like you're stigmatized for taking a medication or anything right. like that. Right. Cause I know it happens, um, in, in other places that that will not happen here. Um, and cause I know, cause we share clients. That's how I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, happens. and, and lots of great results, um, coming from, from that school. So, yes. um, I think yes. it's amazing and I certainly, um, stand by it and, yeah. um, hope that uh, more people will, uh, you know, find it, find it interesting and helpful for them because you're doing a really good work. I really um, appreciate so I want that. To emphasize yeah. that. I mm -hmm. really appreciate it. And if I could say one more thing about the school that surprised me, sure. I, you know, I feel like I have to say this because, you know, I knew going into building it, I felt in my core anyway, like if I could build this, they will come and mm -hmm. it will be helpful, you know? And I thought if I could really, so all my emphasis was on building the core curriculum and all of that. And then you launch the school and people start to come and you start to see their results and they're taking it and everything's, it's even better than you thought. And you go, oh man, this has been amazing. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad that I did this because it's terrifying when you're making it. You mm -hmm. know, you start to think, is anybody going to show up? What if they don't show up? What if, what if I wasted three years doing this, you know? And, they, and it opened and it did really well and it started to catch on. But I'll tell you, the one thing that surprised me that I have to give the credit to my students on was mm -hmm. the community. Like the people, again, people are generally good people, you know, and we're all yeah. terrified through this. But once they sort of all got on the same page, once they mm -hmm. went through the modules and they understood the teachings and how we were trying to not feed the bear and, and actually befriend mm -hmm. the bear and make peace with this and find acceptance and all of this... Yeah. Um, it caught on like wildfire, like it caught on. And then mm -hmm. the community itself became such a, maybe equally, if not more of a powerful force for healing than I ever yeah. could imagine. I mean, I could not imagine. Nobody prepared me for that. I never was taught that in my clinical training. Mm -hmm. I said, wow, the power of putting enough loving people, compassionate people together 
giving them some tools and, and we're all on the same page and let that happen. Yeah. And it was amazing. You know, people would, you know, cause it's one thing to hear it from me to say, you're going to get better. It's another to see someone who you watched suffer making real progress mm -hmm. and go from being bed bound to taking her kids to soccer practice, you know, wow. and they start to go, wait, that's possible. Wow. Mm -hmm. She's in the middle of her taper and she's taking her kids to soccer practice. Yeah. I didn't know that was possible or, well, she takes magnesium and she's doing great. I thought you couldn't do that. Like it was, it wasn't just me telling them things anymore. They could see. And, and then you might say, well, you see that in other communities. I don't think you do to this point. I, mm -hmm. I think because you need a certain guiding force in there. You need a certain mm -hmm. philosophy or, uh, you know, a sort of guiding force in there. It's positive sort of, you know, driven yeah. and it's driven yeah. off of being positive. And, and like you said, you, you've understood that a lot of some of these other communities that maybe aren't even monitored, you know, they're just kind yeah. of forum. They're just people speaking. Um, and, and so, um, you know, t texting or whatever it is, you know, in the forums, you're making comments, right, right, right. but, um, it's, it's driving the fear, which is what you call the bear, you know, it's, it's yeah. creating this monster in the room of bear, um, that becomes overpowering, and so in order to tame it, we've got to reinforce and kind of go back to where did we come from? How did we get here? Yeah. And that's what you teach them and do in, in the, uh, yeah. the school. But then once they right. see that, it's it, they realize, oh, wow. you know. And so when yeah. someone comes in who's stuck in that phase, right? And uh, yeah. you know, they're in fear, they're, they have the bear there. People can kind of comfort them and let them know it's okay, this yeah. is normal you know, understand this, you know, start here at this module and things will get yeah. better and they That's can right. see other people um, getting better that have been through it. Yeah. So I think that's Absolutely. wonderful. Yeah. Cause yeah, not a lot of cool. people share the positive stories right. um, in the communities cause they don't want to, you know, re um, expose themselves, you know, yeah. that's a thing too, you know, going right. back to that community is kind of, you know, cause there's a lot of trauma that's involved in this as yeah. well you get you know, medical trauma and, and trauma from the benzo and medication yeah. you know feeling gaslit you know all of these things yeah. right um as well absolutely yeah and you know they understand the curriculum like for example i tell them rumination is the enemy it is such mm. the enemy in this thing mm -hmm. and i say you'll ruminate until you have a north star because rumination is a very healthy problem solving mechanism until it isn't, you know, mm -hmm. then it becomes completely neurotic and completely exacerbates your symptoms and can make you sick or mm -hmm. sicker. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, everyone understands that. So you see a different mentality, like they'll call each other out. Oh, I'm ruminating again. Or, well, let's not have, let's avoid the symptom talk, right? Let's mm -hmm. avoid a lot of things that just run rampant in those other uh, groups, you know, and mm -hmm. I have a space in the school. It's a private space called um, support chat. And it's a, mm -hmm. like a feed, a, like a general chat where everyone can sign up and go in there. And if they wanted to ask questions about their symptoms, but even then it's a very, it's a different kind of vibe in there. It's very positive mm -hmm. and uplifting and, you know, and, and educational. It's very different. It's mm -hmm. not just people going, oh my God, you know, uh, mm -hmm. it's not that. But if you don't want to see that, you don't have to see it. You have to subscribe to that space to even see it. So it's yeah. completely, because you know, I realized I had two kinds of clients or mm -hmm. students. There was those that said, look, I want to talk about some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And then you had the others that said, I don't want to talk about this. Mm -hmm. It triggers me. I don't want to talk about symptoms. And, you know, I just want to yeah. get with the program and let's do that. So how do you please both? Mm -hmm. So I'll create the schools almost a yin and yang in that regard. We'll have a special space for support and things like that. And and then, of course, if you want to talk to me, I'm very accessible. And I do a uh, I do three hours of Q&A and lessons every Sunday in that school three so 12 hours. hours yeah three hours i go along with them you know wow and i'm actually wanting to and build that's up part of the school that. that's part of the school so wow. you get three hours with essentially a doctorate in clinical psychology who's going mm. through this and and it's like become like a family you know we've got a, mm. uh, over 100 people in the school now and it's like it's just like a big awesome family you know so yeah. i'll get on there on sunday and i might have a lesson like a powerpoint on rumination management skills or cbt or mindfulness mm -hmm. and then um you know, and then we'll do Q&A. So people have a chance to still ask questions Absolutely. and ask all those things or mm -hmm. message me directly. And then, um, you know, I want to grow that to doing a second or third uh, meeting in the week, I think would be nice. So, you know, as a school grows, I think it'll happen organically. Yeah. That's but, wonderful. Yeah. It's wonderful. I think um, what you're offering is a huge, huge value. You do not get 
three hours um, of a clinical psychologist at an entry level $30 a month yeah. school, that's unheard yeah. of. Yeah, that's, that's unheard crazy. of. So you're giving people lots and lots of value above and beyond, um, which is yeah. amazing. Yeah. yeah. I never wanted to exploit anyone because mm -hmm. I know what it, where I was, you yeah. know, and um, yeah. So, you know, I know a lot of people are struggling and maybe even on disability or something, you know, mm -hmm. they're not working. And I, and I wanted something, you know, and it's done well enough, you know, yeah. you, you don't need to charge $500 a month or something ridiculous yeah. like that you know yeah. it, it was worth it to me and, and it was my way of also giving back mm -hmm. you know what I mean trying to give back and serve the the community a little bit there so yeah well that's wonderful Great. thank you so much uh, for sharing your story and everything that you're doing uh, for mm. the benzo community I know it's it's hard work I know firsthand before we close I'd like to to leave on are there things that um, you can do like a message of hope for people who are in this or providers who are in this as well like um, you know what kind of things do you do to kind of keep going right right so the message first I would give to the people going through it is, um, like I said, no matter how damaged you are, no matter how bad you feel, no matter how much you're convinced that you can't come back from this, the brain is a wonderful thing. You know, mm -hmm. it is very resilient. It is very pliable, very plastic, very adaptable. You know, I mean, neuroplasticity is an amazing thing. You can lose your whole speech center of your brain and your brain can relocate that and reform those pathways and, and you can develop speech again. Like, this is unheard of. No other organ does that. You know, you can't damage half of your heart and it regrows it. This is incredible. This means this is very, you can be born with half a hemisphere missing and still go on to live a pretty normal, productive life. I mean, that's pretty incredible. You can't do that with any other organ. You can't remove half your heart. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of hope there in the power of the brain to heal itself in the body to heal itself. You just got to meet it halfway. Mm -hmm. You know, that's really my message. And I think that's very similar with your message, I would think, from mm -hmm. our talks, you know, meet it halfway, do the right things, be healthy, and um, don't give in to the fear, because the fear is a, is a great paralyzer, and it's a yeah. liar. It, it will lie to you, and it'll make you hopeless, and when you become hopeless, your limbic system escalates into crisis, becomes locked up, and then you can get stuck. Yeah. And that's why a little bit of hope goes a long way. Hope yes. is the canoe that gets you across the river, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I would say to that audience and to providers, you know, a um, couple things. I mean, one, um, don't get complacent in what you're doing. Listen, listen to your, your clients, get to know them, you know, share. And, um, and, you know, and if you start to feel that way, then maybe step back or something or, you know, uh, self-care is huge in this business, mm -hmm. huge in this business. You have to take care of yourself. You know, and if you go chasing after money or if you try to be something you're not, people can smell it a mile away. They know yeah. when you're being phony. Mm -hmm. They know when you're not being genuine. So you just have to be yourself, put it out there. Maybe they'll like you. Maybe they won't. You know, you don't know. It's a risk. You know, like you've been very successful and you, you know, you do have to step back and think, you know, a thousand people could run this experiment and not have the success that I've had. Why? What is it about me? that is working here. And sometimes I, who knows, it's almost like being a great musician or something, you know, mm -hmm. uh, who knows? Is it luck? Is it just people are receptive to you? You know, do you have mm -hmm. a, some, I don't know what it is. You know, I wish I knew, um, you know, but self-care is hugely important. Be honest, be transparent and, um, and keep learning, you know, and keep learning. That's and right. finally, one last thing on this, don't be rigid. You know, we got to break out of the, you call it the purists, you know, um, oh, the, yeah. we got to break out of that fundamentality, that mm -hmm. sort of benzo doctrine that was created. And, in, in, you know, we need to break out of that and open our minds to things mm -hmm. and not be so, you know, quick to dismiss it. Oh, this doesn't work. That doesn't work. You know, you know, one size does not fit all in benzos. Mm -hmm. It is all a subjective. What works for the next person might not work for the next. And that's OK. But yeah. share the whole story. Don't don't say magnesium or this doesn't work or that doesn't work or therapy doesn't work. You know, you might be harming your client. And, and also the people that say, you know, you can never take an antidepressant or something. I have a huge issue with that. You shouldn't mm -hmm. as someone working in this field it is not your job. This is my philosophy to tell people what they should do. Mm -hmm. You can should give them the information, advise them, maybe even say what you would do in their situation. But I personally just think it's it's unethical for me to say you can't do that. Mm. you shouldn't do that you you know mm -hmm. and that's they're the ones that's got to live with that choice yeah. you know what i mean and then you yeah. have to live with the choice that if you influence their choice in a bad way that's on you too 
Mm-hmm. So those two things would be pretty important that I would say. And um, before we go, um, I just wanted to mention, if it's okay, quickly, that um, because I'm so excited about it, maybe we can talk about this next time you and mm-hmm. I get together like this. Um, I'm so close to finishing this feature film. You know, we made a, oh, we yeah. raised money and, and shot a feature film. It's been in the work for a few years, mm-hmm. a full length. I think the first film that I've seen on benzo recovery, you know, a, about someone going through this whole thing yeah. that we've been talking about and then finding, you know, their way out of this, out of this yeah, place. That so, would be great. Cool. Yeah. yeah. And you, that's, that information is on the website, but you're going to be, that's releasing soon. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, saying, yeah oh, yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, cool. so that would be great to have you back for the film and for the book. Yeah, we absolutely. can talk more about both. Thank of you those so much. Topics. Yeah, I yeah, absolutely. You. Yeah, it's exciting. I'm excited about both of those things as well because it sounds like we'll get to learn more about, um, yeah, you know, the process through a film. A lot of people, yeah, um, with movies and things like that, it can be very touching and a good way to explain uh, and show other people who don't understand yes. what what this actually is all about. Exactly. And that was a big driving uh, inspiration, you know, behind that, the, it's called Lake of Fire, the, this Benzo film, mm. was I wasn't just wanting to validate us, you know, the people mm-hmm. or the ben, people in the Benzo community, um, but I wanted to have something that they could show their fa- friends and family or their, you know, someone that doesn't understand this. Because like you said, film has a powerful way of pulling you in and showing you something that you wouldn't know. You know, I could watch a film on Vietnam, you know, uh, the war of Vietnam or something. I never was in war. I don't know what that's like. But you watch certain movies and you do. You come away with that vicarious experience of like, wow, I I look at that differently now. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I can see it from different angles. I can empathize with these people in a way that I couldn't before. And and so that was the goal to create a movie that was very much a, a uh, a family drama in a sense in some ways and a personal drama um, mm-hmm. that pulled the viewers in and you know hopefully the person could be sitting there maybe with their spouse watching it who just doesn't quite get it and they can find themselves going yep that's you you know mm-hmm. in a kind of dismissal way but then halfway through the movie you start to get really invested and you go wait a minute this is feeling different mm-hmm. okay hold on now I'm starting to understand this differently and then by the end of the film hopefully you're just emotionally you've gone through this roller coaster ride and you can start to maybe have a little more empathy to the people yeah. going through it. You know, that was a Absolutely. Big, big driving force. Yeah. So it can reach family members and even providers who have no clue sure. or yeah. don't believe that this thing even exists. There's still people out there like that who right. think that you can jump off from 50 milligrams of, of diazepam, cut that right. in half and keep going. I mean, it's, it's yeah. unbelievable. Yes, it is. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I'm excited about that myself, and um, that would be great to have you back on uh, yeah. to talk more about that film. And um, hopefully, I'll be able to to watch the film, preview it before, yeah. and we can have That'd a conversation cool. about it. That'd be yeah. awesome. Yeah, I definitely do that for you. I'll give you a sneak peek on all of that, yeah. the film and the book. I'll, I'll let you know first. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much. So you've yeah. heard it here first on Level Headed Mind uh, with Coach Powers. So, um, you know, make sure to check out his website, check out his links, which are in the description down below. Um, get his book, The Powers Manual, and uh, be on the lookout for the up and coming feature film and book. Uh, that's coming out as well. So thank you all for being here as always. I wish you all well on your mental health care journey, and I look forward to seeing you all next week.